everybody. Welcome to the Luthierist Podcast. I'm Paul Roney. I'm Jason Rogers. And uh, we're coming to you this week a little worse for the wear. <laughs> a little beat up and a little uh, a little under the weather. And, and uh, yeah. <laughs> how are you feeling, Jason? I'm okay. I had a, had a long week uh, with the day job. A lot of late nights with uh, band concerts and stuff. I used a lot of words this weekend. My right. voice is fun. My voice is kind of funky today, so I hope I hope I'm coming across clearly to our listeners. I think you sound all right. Um, oh, good. Yeah, um, but what and, about uh, you, though? <laughs> well, uh, I, I I done got myself in a little a little accident. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I I was was riding a friend's moped and uh and went down, and broke my arm. So oh. uh, I'm sitting here with with it on a nice pack, elevated, wrapped up and waiting for my surgery forthcoming yeah. surgery <laughs> coming, coming uh, next week coming to you next week surgery. <laughs> sutures and all yeah yes. so that's fun um wow yeah like here's hoping for you know full recovery and indeed and stuff. um not not too much pain like i'm not i'm not writing in pain or anything but it's, it's well that's good it's just just a lot of like uh doing things with only one arm yeah no opportunities to get uh, addicted to opioids or anything like that yeah no not gonna happen not gonna happen not gonna happen um <laughs> not at all um but of course you know we wanted to forge ahead and uh make sure that uh, we still do the show uh i think that um uh, we're having a lot of fun here still doing the show every week and um yeah i know that uh that you guys are out there listening so uh we do know that uh you loved our conversation with Frank Falbo, I'm sure. I hope everybody was into that. I know uh, that was one of my favorites that we've done recently. Frank's just Ditto. sort of a yeah. wealth of knowledge. And I think you and I were texting each other afterwards, sort of saying that. <laughs> well, <laughs> that was awesome. epic. Like, <laughs> yeah. So cool. He's a guy that, uh, you know, I don't think we could have enough shows. Uh, with him right, right. All that he stuff. Would but be on any topic and he would be able to hook us up with some deep knowledge and and to be able to explain it in a way that everybody would always understand he's yeah. he's so good at that it's way cool so uh but we wanted to talk a little bit more this week uh about multi-scale i think because uh the interest in it is definitely high these days mm -hmm. um and um so i think people are kind of wondering like you know how can i build a multi-scale guitar and uh why would i want to so this is uh our multi-scale DIY FYI. Right, and we'll be talking about everything that you might need to know to start designing your own multi-scale instrument, or just if you have an opportunity to play a multi-scale instrument either at a, at a show or if you're lucky enough in your boutique uh, local guitar shop that they have uh, an instrument that is multi-scale, kind of just understanding how to approach it. You know, like what are some of the things that you're going to want to look for and think about um, and comparing uh, different different designs and things like that. So um, stay tuned. So Jason, yeah. what's all the hype about multi-scale? It's awesome. Uh, why would someone want to play <laughs> much less build a multi-scale guitar when there are just like way too many options in the standard scale instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, wouldn't it be more trouble to learn to play on? I mean, those fret, those frets is all slanty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, what are the benefits? Sell right. me on it. You know, I mean, yeah. what, what's, what's up? What's up? What up with that? It's a good question because, um, and I, and I know that I have to, I have to answer this when I, I'm at guitar shows because that's one of the first things that people say. Like, wait, what's going on here? This why are they all slanty? <laughs> why are they all tilted? <laughs> and I think you um, did that wrong. I have to, um, I have to, to create some good, uh, some good kind of one-liners. But I'm going to give you the the extended version here. <clears throat> you know, the original idea um, that Ralph Novak of Novak's Guitars had was that. Um, and 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 we got to be careful here because no, he he didn't necessarily invent this, you know. Um, and that was a, there was a bit of controversy 
when he patented it. Um, but you know, it's when it comes to when it comes to things out under the sun, um, there's, there's a lot of things, and a lot of them have been done. Um, and sometimes it's just whoever gets to the patent first wins. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, but his his original idea for doing this was that that it it created some optimization for tuning, okay. and it, it created this balance of of tuning and tension and intonation um, by providing mainly by providing more length to the bass side. And kind of the idea is if you look inside a piano and you see the low strings, they have they're very long and they're thick, and the high strings they're short and they're thin. And so there's this this balance of tension and tuning and intonation. Um, and he wanted to bring some of that to the guitar. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that you can do with a standard scale instrument just through choosing your, your string gauges. Um, but there are some very, very real limits that you come upon, especially when you're going beyond standard tuning. So, if, you know, for a six string guitar, a standard tuning, a multi-scale is, is not going to add a ton of benefit to it. But as soon as you want to take that six string guitar and stu start doing drop tuning, um, then you need to adjust your string gauge. And you can only do that so far until you run into intonation problems with the, the strings itself. The strings can actually be out of tune with themselves. It's called inharmonicity, where the, the, the string gauge that you're attempting to tune to a certain pitch um, just can't handle it. And it's your guitar is out of tune with itself. So you can, you know, you can intonate the open string and the 12th fret, but as soon as you start playing up and down the fretboard, you start noticing that it's, it's out of tune all over the place. So, um, multi-scale attempts to, to remedy this. And so it especially works for drop tuning, non-standard tuning, and especially if you want to do extended range. Um, so seven and eight string guitars, it's, it's gorgeous. And you heard, uh, Frank, talking about um, taking uh, that, that, that tuning that Tosin Abasa uses, mm -hmm. um, which is eight string guitar. So it has a low B plus it has an eighth string and it's not, he doesn't just go to F sharp. He does a drop E on that, right. which is ridiculously low tuning for a, yeah. a guitar. Um, so, so 27 inches is, is the and, and balancing that scale length with the string gauges he uses he's able to get good tone good intonation in particular and that's something that of course uh, Tosin Abasi is looking for um, in recent years um, there have been some builders who have presented multi-scale as an ergonomic feature sure. um, I've not really experienced this in my own hands but of course I, I don't have any injuries you know uh, repetitive stress or, or tendon or joint issues that are exacerbated by or or alleviated by any sort of uh, geometries of the instrument. So mm -hmm. I haven't experienced that myself. It doesn't mean that people don't experience that. Um, just in our uh, one of our last interviews with um, Michael Sankey, he said he came to you know, start using multi-scale because he had a customer who said, hey, I want a seven string guitar, but make it short scale. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, Michael knowing um, about scales and string gauges and things like that said, well, you're probably not going to get, um, without, you know, going to heroic lengths with, with, with scale, uh, with, with, sorry, with, uh, string gauge, um, you're probably not going to be able to get that short scale that you want for, for alleviating your, your, your hand pain, um, mm -hmm. and still be able to get good tone. So that's when he started mixing it. So he went short scale on the treble, shorter scale on the treble side, and a long, a longer or a standard or a longer scale on the bass side. I can't remember mm -hmm. exactly what scale lengths he chose there, but sure. um, I can definitely see how how going shorter on the treble side um, would, would could help out with some of those reach issues that people have in wrist and, and forearm injuries and stuff. Sure. Um, when isn't, it comes isn't Perry to, Ormsby a good example of that as well? I believe, if I recall correctly, he made his first multi scale. Uh, off of the idea of, I think he has arthritis or tendonitis or something, mm -hmm. and it was just painful to play a standard scale guitar, and mm -hmm. so he had this idea of like slanting it like that in order to yeah. to compensate and, for that. So that's what what worked for and, him. And there's some there's some interviews out there with him where he he talks about um, uh, 
talking with players and and um, looking at players and their and their their playing position, you know, the angle of the neck, the positioning of the hand, and um, and really trying to figure out a good a good balance between um, the natural position of the hand and the uh, and and the the stretch of the scales on there. And so mm-hmm. and so um, yeah, if 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 people are going for uh, going going to multi scales for ergonomic reasons, um, you know that's 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 a player's choice, and it's a wonderful choice now that that the multi scale is out there in in a variety of of orientations um, to fit people's hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, when it comes to just like the general feel of a multi scale when you pick it up, a lot of it has to do with just how far and how um, how much the, those scales are stretched. Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, on my six string guitars, I use 25 to 26 inch. And um, a lot of times people are, are very surprised at how little they notice it. Um, and, uh, and once they get past that, just the visual part of it, and they start playing it, and then they start noticing the tone, and then they start noticing the, the, the feel across the fretboard. Um, they 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 forget about the multi scale this the the fanning of the frets um, when it comes to uh, wider stretches um, you know I, I think uh, Ormsby does go from twenty five and a half to right away like twenty seven and a quarter on the yeah. six six strings um, that that is that's a big bit of a stretch um, mm-hmm. and and you're gonna uh, you're gonna notice that I think a little bit more um, just any guitar that that has a, a a longer stretch of probably more than an inch. You you might notice it in the lower like first position area. You might notice it up um, above the twelfth fret, maybe up near the heel, mm-hmm. in the weedly deedly areas. Um, and it's just because those are the areas where the frets are kind of cascading over each other a little bit more. There's more of that tilt and overlap. Um, but really, it's um, you know it's something that uh, a, a lot of people say, you know, I, I yeah, I might have noticed it at first, but um, they get past it really quickly. You know, 10, 15 minutes of playing. Definitely, if you're, you know, you've got your new multi-scale guitar and you play it for a week straight, um, it, you, you're you're going to stop thinking about that. You're going to be surprised at how fast your hand adjusts and adapts to things. Um, and then you just you're just excited and happy about tuning you're excited and happy about intonation and uh, that that nice even tension across the strings happy happy joy joy 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 all right so i don't actually build multi-scale guitars myself so this is kind of cool i will convert you you're, you're, you're converting me. You're, you're winning me over. You're making me want to get back into Rhino and start uh, doing some yeah. drafting. But gosh, where, I mean, where do I start with that drafting? You know, where do I start when designing a multi-scale guitar? Well, when you're, I, I think probably a good place to start designing any guitar is um, just by drawing it out on a big old piece of paper and starting with a, a nice long center line and then starting to throw down whatever scale or scales that you're going to use. I remember, um, you know, getting the, um, the Cumpiano and Nadelson book, um, back in the day. And, and that's one of the first lessons in the book is slap that center line down and start drawing in whatever scale you're going to use. And then everything, the guitar sort of, sort of, uh, takes shape around that. And a multi-scale instrument is no different than that. Um, in the early days when I was when I was experimenting on big old pieces of paper, um, I was going to, you know, like um, Stumac and LMI to, to just look at some of the the um, the, the fret uh, scale calculators, the spreadsheets they had. Mm-hmm. And um, I made some spreadsheets myself in Excel. And I was and I was like literally just, you know, printing out the spreadsheet with the numbers and then sitting down with my big old piece of paper with. Mm-hmm the ruler and and drawing everything out and the really really simple description of setting up a, a multi-scale is that you get your your center line um you choose your your treble side scale you choose your bass side scale and you set them down uh, around that center line 
and you move them around until you get the splay of of scales that you want. And um, there's that that phrase neutral fret we keep coming back to. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, where where is that one fret going to be perpendicular to the center line? Mm -hmm. And it can be anywhere. You know, we we talked about with Frank um, that uh, there's a there's a a lot of the 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 manufacturers of multi-scale, they're putting that, that, that putting that, per, that neutral fret, that perpendicular fret in all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. um, Strandberg puts it at the nut on his six strings. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that, uh, that Novak's did was, uh, I think seven or nine. Um, uh, Frank's, uh, Frank and Abbasi are doing, um, what is it? The, the ninth, eighth of the ninth, um, Ormsby is choosing the seventh or the eighth, and so it's it's choosing choosing where do you want the least splay to happen, mm -hmm. um, and then um, you it's very important that you remember that the because of this multi scale thing and the path of the strings across it, you have to set up your scales based on your outside strings and the taper that you're intending to use. I was going to ask that, like yeah. if I'm drawing this, do I draw like my, you know, my first scale length for the base side and do I kind of take that, that drawing, those markings and, and, and rotate them slightly, like shift it slightly so that, yeah. you know, it's, it, it matches the taper of the fretboard. So that yes. if I were to take the finished guitar and hold a ruler up to the fretboard edge, you know, I would have my two scalings would be easily measurable right there, actually, on, right on that actually, edge. Like, does it taper like that, or does it, or do I draw them straight and then kind of connect the dots? And so it's either, actually so they're all slightly strings. off. It's actually the outside strings because if you think oh. about this, okay. So if you think about your, let's say a six string, and you're talking about your E string, mm -hmm. and if you're thinking about these frets that are starting wider on the bass side, and they are converging towards the treble side, if you take even, a, even if a, an eighth of an inch fretboard offset, and you take and you move that to the outside of the fretboard, yeah. and you move it to the string, you're, you're moving across that convergence of yeah. frets. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. And so the same, in the opposite towards um, the bass side, you're talking about frets that are diverging and so, and so, where that is, where, where that point along that string length, that string path, um, mm -hmm. it matters. It matters. It's going to change a bit. So, uh, when you're done with a multi-scale instrument, if you put a ruler against the outside of the fretboard, let's say that you are going to start with 25 inches, you're going to find that the outside of the fretboard is slightly less than 25 okay. because the string, the high E string is the 25. And on gotcha. the base side, you're going to find that the, the outside of the fretboard is a little bit longer than let's say if you did 26, sure. um, because the, the string itself is going to be 26. And so that's a really important thing because you're going to, you can run into all sorts of problems with, with, uh, with intonation and, and then later on bridge placement, if you don't use that. So, I'm going to ask you right now, folks, um, to if you want to if you want to do this, I'm going to make this sort of like a tutorial because um, after after I kind of cut my teeth on um, on just doing the paper um, and ruler method, I found through the forums a wonderful online fret calculator called FretFind 2D, and it's spelled F R E T F I N D number two letter D. And it's this wonderful little tool that allows you to not only um, experiment with different uh, scale lengths and, and fretboard widths and all that kind of stuff and the number of strings also, but you can also save it as a PDF and print out full scale templates. And this is what I do. So if you want to hit pause right now and go find, find 2D, um, and then turn on again when you find it, and I'll walk you through this. All right? Hit pause. Whoop. Welcome back. So you're looking at Fret Find 2D right now, and um, as you look at this screen here, um, you're going to find on the left hand side there's a whole bunch of little little boxes where you can fill in different measurements. In the middle is going to be sort of a a, a rendering of a of a fretboard in full scale from nut to bridge. 
And on the right side, there's a whole bunch of buttons where you can save to different file types. Now, um, if you are clever with the um, with the CNC, the CAD CAM stuff, you can actually save this as a DXF file, and you can import that into your um, your CAD drawings um, and use that as your scaling. So, um, if if you're if you're smart and clever like that, you can do this. There's also another uh, other different types of formats that you can probably import them into things like, um, I don't know if you use uh, Corel or if you use Inkscape or um, what do you use, Paul, for doing a lot of your stuff? Largely uh, Adobe Illustrator, Illustrator. Um, but, I, but I'm yeah. adapting to uh, Rhinoceros lately. Yeah, so I think I think all of these file types can work across a number of platforms. So let's just kind of get... Um, get um, uh, familiar with it here first you have units and of course it's inches because he uses the metric system stupid metric system um you have scale length and it allows you to um do single multiple and individual scale lengths which is really interesting um it allows you to um set string widths at the nut and the bridge fretboard overhang remember that's the distance from your outside strings to the edge of the fretboard um you can do different uh fret calculation you can actually do a just scale that's that would be interesting you're not going to be able to play in too many keys but that's interesting um number of frets number of strings um if you scroll down you actually get if you do want to do this the old uh paper and ruler method it gives you these massive um uh, spreadsheets that tells you exactly what the measurements from fret to fret from nut to fret from fret to bridge and all these different um different uh, measurements can be if you want to do it that way um so let's let's walk through this and let's enter some stuff here so first we're going to set up some basic um some basic parameters here so keep the let's keep it right now it's set at 25 inches just see, keep it there as a single single scale length there um and go down to the box that says string width at the nut and remember this is string width. This is not actual nut width, because when we talk about guitars, we talk about nut width. So, for example, six string, very, very typical nut width is one and eleven sixteenths. Um, so you're going to subtract your eighth inch offset on the sides, and that's going to give you um, uh, 1.4375. So type that in there. Um, go to string width at the bridge. Now, uh, your typical bridge width is, uh, for a six string across many instruments, is uh, two and a sixteenth, give or take a, a smidge. So go to uh, string width at the bridge and type in 2.0625. Um, for fretboard overhang, um, you can, so this is going to set your actual, your actual fretboard width along the full length of the fretboard um, so it says equal nut and bridge or first and last or all and so you can click through these and see these different ways of calculating your um, your your fretboard width offset from the string um, I like to do nut and bridge and I like to have the offset at the nut be an eighth of an inch so type in 0.125 and I like my fretboard to flare out just a tiny bit past the strings a little bit more than eighth of an inch um, going up towards the 12th and, and up towards the, the heel of the guitar. Um, and so I, I put in um, three sixteenths inch there. So I uh, put in 0.1875. And when you do this, um, you can keep it at uh, equal root, um, 12th root, wait, the 12th root of eight, eight, 17. What is that? What's that rule? The rule of 18, whatever. <laughs> Keep yeah. it there. Um, the number of frets is 24, six, uh, six strings is fine. And then when you put that all there, um, you're going to get this layout, right? So that that's giving you kind of a standard fretboard layout. Um, now, if you go back and click multiple, now it's going to open up some more boxes there. And the first thing that the default there is 25 to 28. And just looking at that, you can see like, wow, that's a that's a three inch difference in scale length. That splays things quite a lot, um, and um, it ob automatically sets the perpendicular fret distance at the twelfth. Um, so 
take a there's a little question mark there. It says perpendicular fret distance and click on the little question mark and it opens up a little dialog box and it gives you some more information. This is how you set your neutral fret. And it's um, basically it's a ratio of the entire scale. So 0.5 means that is exactly in the middle. That's where the 12th, so that's setting it up as the 12th fret, as the neutral fret. Um, it, instead of making you do the math, um, the makers of Fine 2D made this nice little chart for you there. So if you did want to do um, a, a neutral fret somewhere else, um, let's say that you were going to put it like uh, the Strandberg six strings um, and you wanted it at the nut. So you type in zero there. And when you type in zero, that automatically snaps the whole thing to have all of the splay at the bridge end and no splay at the nut end. If you typed in one, it does the opposite. Um, and this is actually what, uh, this is what Ormsby is doing with his, his new, was it called classic and scarab models where he's using mm -hmm. um, uh, some standard uh, trims and standard tunematic style uh, bridges where it, it makes the, the bridge be the neutral point and then all the splay falls away from there. Um, so if you can look in that this tiny little typing there in that little box, um, if you wanted to put it at the ninth fret, you would type in 0 0.0054, 0 0.0054, 4, 4, 4, 0, 0, 0. and boom, it snaps it. And now you see that the that, that neutral fret, that perpendicular fret, is basically in the center um, of the of a 24 fret fretboard, and that's and that's also kind of one of the um, one of the uh, the uh, um, rationalizations for putting that perpendicular fret at the ninth fret because it is sort of in the center of the fretboard like that. So um, that is a that's just a quick run through of how to set that up. Um, now, if you want to save your um you want to save this into um a file that you can use for a full size uh, template you go over to the right there and um it says pdf multi-page letter and you hit save to disk and it'll bring up um a save box there um call it whatever you want um save it to whatever folder you're going to put it in but remember on this particular little uh, calculator here, you have to put the suffix in. So what? It, so let's say you're going to call it multi-scale fretboard dot PDF. You have to put that PDF in there, otherwise it saves it as a generic file type and you can't open it up. Later on, when you open up this PDF in Acrobat or whatever, and you print it out, you'd need to make sure that you print it um, um, print it as actual size. Um, do not do, um, a lot of times when you open up um, a PDF and you try to print it, it, it defaults to um, fit to page. Don't let it do that because it'll completely skew it. This, this, um, this PDF saving option allows you to create that full size template. Um, it'll print it out as, you know, a standard, um, uh, a, small stretch, you know, 25 to 26, 25 to 25 and a half or something like that. Um, it'll probably be about three pages. Um, a bass guitar, um, if you're going like 34 to 35 or 36, it'll probably give you four pages. Um, and just really carefully tape them together and, uh, and cut it out. And then there you have a full scale, um, multi-scale fretboard from nut all the way to bridge. And you can drop that down onto your um, your center line, and then um, from there you can start uh, making some other design choices about what you want your guitar to look like. That that's amazing. I, I was kind of doing this along with with everyone with as you mm -hmm. were explaining this, and like I was familiar with this before, but I didn't know it had quite this much power or information. Yeah, that that's in this thing. This is this is incredible, and and I hope that I hope that this website never goes down. I don't know if there's some way to like save it to your computer, which 
I'm going to try to do, but like, that's, that's quite <laughs> cool. Also, I would say maybe like pro tip, I guess, but if you enter a number of frets as 25 instead of 24, then it will give you a line for where to cut off the end of your fretboard. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's there you a go. good idea. That's what I always do whenever yeah. I, I have like a modified PDF file for scaling. Uh-huh that I use and it, it goes to 25 because that just always gives me that line for, oh, here's where you cut it. This is clever, Mr. Roney. Mm. I like that. I have a few good ideas. <laughs> Okay, so obviously we've got our scale length. Mm -hmm. We even have our fretboard taper now, thanks yeah, to the Fretline 2D. Cool. It's a pretty incredible. Um, what about the nut and the bridge? I think that's obviously going to require some special consideration. Um, you know, we're, we're not just slapping any normal hardware or, right. uh, or, or, or bone nut or whatever on there. Um, so, so what are we thinking about there? Like, what are some of the, the tips and tricks as far as the nut and bridge are concerned? So for any guitar, when you're, when you're thinking about the nut and how the strings um, travel from the nut to the, the headstock and to the tuners, um, you, you need to think about that path. And you need to think about um, uh, an appropriate you know, breakover so that there's enough downward pressure on the nut that, that it, you know, the strings don't jump out and mm -hmm. so you don't get some weird buzz and stuff like that from the nut end. Um, and generally, there have been two solutions, and uh, the one is the angled headstock. Mm -hmm. And whether you're cutting that doing a one-piece neck where it's actually cut out of, uh, of the, the blank, or whether you're doing a scarfed headstock, which you're doing these angled cuts and, and taking that piece of the end of the, of the neck blank and flipping it over so now it's at falling away at an angle, whatever that angle is, somewhere between probably eight and 15 degrees, depending on your, your construction style. Um, but when you have a, when you have an angled nut from the multi scale, now the strings are falling over that and the strings projection towards the tuners is different. Um, oh, I forgot about, yes, there's the, the flat headstock too, the, the fender style flat mm -hmm. headstock, just the sure. drop down. Right. Um, so yes, but in both cases you've got this angled nut now, and um, and how do you how do you deal with that? So um, if you just simply do a um, if you just simply take like let's say your angled headstock, and you just change the angle of the nut, you start realizing that as the strings come over the nut, they're going to crash into the edge of the the the, the fretboard that's continuing, or they're going to crash into the surface of um, the headstock itself. Just like the Dave Matthews song. <laughs> Crash into you. <laughs> so Sounds there's like a been a joke. couple. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and the same thing with the flat headstock, with the, with the fender style, just, you know, uh, lower elevation. The, the, the headstock plane is at a lower elevation than the, the top of the fretboard. Um, so, so what do you do? Well, there's a couple things that you can do. Um, one is that some people um, will simply take that extra little triangle. So if you imagine just a reg your normal fretboard, and now instead of the nut being straight perpendicular across the top of it, it's now angled at some whatever angle is resulting from your scale choices. And you've got this extra little triangle of wood there, right, on the treble side. So what do you do with it? Because that's where the strings are going to run into it. Um, one thing that some people do is just simply scoop that away. Um, and so it's either, it's either just simply dropped, um, to a lower elevation so that the strings don't hit it. Um, or it's just sort of gracefully kind of scooped away. And I've done both of those things and it works out fine. Um, some people, um, adjust the construction of their headstock, um, in order to create a, a fretboard that ends with the angle of the nut. And then, um, so, so for example, uh, if you have one of those, an angled headstock 
like Ormsby actually does, an angled headstock, and then the headstock is additionally tilted towards the treble side so mm -hmm. that the, the, the angle of the nut determines that, that fall away of that side. Um, other people who do just the flat fender style headstock, they simply create that scoop. There's that sort of uh, just kind of ramp from the fretboard down to the headstock face. They just angle that ramp. And I've done that too. Um, I've not attempted the uh, the actual angled and sort of compound angled headstock. That that is a, a little bit of um, jiggery that I've not attempted yet. But I think mm -hmm. that is a really good that's a good um, solution if you can if you can figure out the geometry and the mass of that. Um, so it's it's uh, it does take a little bit of consideration. You are going to have to adjust your construction. A little bit to um, to take care of that. One thing that I did try, also, because um, I use zero fret on all my guitars. Mm -hmm. Zero fret is really nice, um, just anyways, because the way that you dress your frets and the way that you, um, you know, leave that zero fret alone, um, it sort of creates this perfect action at the at the at the first position end at the nut end. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to worry about um, your your nut just becomes a string guide to to deal with spacing, and you don't have mm -hmm. to worry about all the the little nuances of um, of a, of carving a nut um, with exactly the right you know nut files and exactly the right angles and you know the bottom being curved and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's sort of a little bit of a shortcut, but it works well. Um, one thing that I tried doing once was I had. The, the zero fret be angled, but then I had the nut be um, perpendicular to the end. So that little no man's land of triangular space, mm -hmm. talking about before there, is now just an extra length of string. And mm -hmm. um, it, I think I think it can work well. I've seen some people do it, and it works well for them. Um, I, I didn't really like the results there because the string, when you bend it, it can still slide across that zero fret a little bit because you do sometimes end up with, you know, when you're high E string, you can end up with, you know, half an inch of space there between the zero fret and the nut. Um, and so it can slide across there a little bit. So that's, um, I, I, I've tried basically all, mo almost all of the options for the nut end. Um, mm -hmm. And they all have some benefits. They all have some, some frustrations in terms of uh, construction and accuracy and stuff. Um, but the nut end is definitely, um, an area of the guitar that you need to consider uh, and and um, you need to be you know think about and this is where all of those um, full scale drawings and all the different projections you know looking the top looking um, doing a side view and really thinking about how those strings are coming off of the nut and traveling towards the tuners and making sure they're not crashing into anything. And, that, and for those of you that are uh, using 3D modeling software. Um, mm -hmm. These are the points at which you'll be very thankful for features like the three-point cutting plane, uh, <laughs> you know, which lets you. I'll trust uh, you on that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those things where you can kind of just say that here, here, you know, as reference points, draw a line, draw an angle, or whatever, and then you know you just start splicing things, and you get, you know, there you go, you're done. You know, it's, it's a very yeah. very cool features. So. At the other end of the string termination at the bridge, um, you also have to have some some careful considerations. Um, and and one of the things I, I would suggest doing is, is that as you're designing your multi-scale, and this kind of needs to be done sort of in parallel with choosing your, um, your, your, your scale layout, is really figuring out what your bridge solution is going to be. Um, because uh, there are if you're buying a commercially available bridge, there aren't a whole lot that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, because of uh, the work that Ormsby did with Hipshot, there are now six, seven, and eight string multi-scale bridges. They're hardtail bridges, um, and they're 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 very very nice. Um, and each of them, the six, the seven, and the eight, comes in about two or three different angled options. Mm -hmm. um, they go from you know a mild angle to a, a more radical angle, and so what you'll need to do is you'll need to um, 
uh, I don't know if it's directly available. I contacted HipShot and, and asked them for the, the schematics on those and they sent them to me. And so I was, I'm able to, to, to look at the exact angle and, and consider um, if that was going to be useful to me. I don't use HipShot and it's not because I don't like HipShot. It's just because I, I am, uh, I have a sickness and that is I have to do everything myself. And so <laughs> I've got my own bridges um, that are yeah. made for me. Um, so so you, you'll need to think about what angles are available in those commercially available bridges and then sort of match those up to um, to, to your scale split. And, and part of that has to do with where you set that neutral fret um, because uh, you, you choosing choosing two scales and choosing a bridge, you just got to come to that compromise of what what works. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to go for trims, um, uh, Caller has a, a multi scale trim. Um, it's it's a little bit ridiculous because it's it's yeah. it's, it's massive, it's huge, <laughs> um, and partly it's because what they tried to do was they tried to maintain a um, a pivot point that is perpendicular to the center line. And then the saddles sort of reach out and extend out from there. Mm -hmm. um, but there are they do come in six, seven, and eight strings, and they do have different um, different extensions that you can put on the different uh, saddles to to give you different splays, different scale options. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other options out there, of course, is that there are single string bridges. Mm -hmm. um, and you buy them individually. You actually buy them individually. So for example, ABM, um, has single. I call them the uh, the toboggan style um, because they look like a little <laughs> like a little toboggan, you know. Yeah. Um, and then there's um, there are a couple of manufacturers that are making single string bridges that basically look like you chopped um, a, a saddle segment off of a fender style yeah. bridge. So it's just like yeah. an L shaped piece of you know base plate, and then it's mm -hmm. got you know a, a fender style um, bridge on there. Um, Actually, actually, I think, I think Novax sells these, um, and they look exactly like that. They're just chopped. They look like mm -hmm. they're chopped off of a yeah. fender bridge. Hipshot um, makes some of those for sure. Yeah, yeah. Hipshot has some. Um, there's also a company called Rondo that has some of those. They're actually um, fairly, fairly inexpensive. Um, so that's um, those. Those are options. Um, the locate the locating of individual string bridges is is a little bit tricky because you're you're locating it um not only along the scale length the appropriate scale length for intonation to be correct but you're also doing the string width and all of that is at an angle of your of your scale termination your, um so so it's a little bit tricky i've done it and and you just have to go slow be careful do a lot of you know put some blue tape down on it um you know take your actual saddles, set them down there, stretch some fishing line from the nut and like look at exactly where these things are landing mm -hmm. and be careful about um, where you're placing them. Um, there's, an, there's another solution that is becoming more commercially available and that is uh, based on Strandberg's design. I call those the, the barrel style. Um, and and uh, those are mainly found on headless style um, uh, uh, bridges. And... Um, and so they, they just literally look like a, a, a little barrel, a little tube. And uh, there is a um, there's a knurled nut on the end there that you turn, and it, that's that's your tuning. And there's all sorts of little set screws and stuff for intonation. And those um, those usually have like a universal base plate, and and those individuals um, are on there. So you know Strandberg originally built those and actually was selling them for a while. I don't think he sells them anymore. Hmm. Um, but a number of other companies have sort of taken up that design. Uh, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but um, they're out there and they basically look exactly like the Strandbergs and you can mm -hmm. get them anodized in all sorts of different colors and stuff like that. So sure. there, there are some options out there. Um, so, um, you know, when you, when you, Design when you design your guitar. You start with that center line. You throw down your your scales, your template, and then really carefully consider where you're getting getting your um, getting your your materials and how you're going to construct that. Um, 
one other thing I wanted to add in terms of bridge construction, um, one other option is doing, um, <clears throat> and I saw, I can't remember where I saw this first, but uh, it's using the, the Wilkinson style um, saddles. So Wilkinson mm. style, um, you know, for, for the, the, the aftermarket um, trims, um, that, that can, they look like a fender style, um, but instead of having the L shaped base plate where the saddle is attached with the set screw from the back, the Wilkinson style ones, um, just look like a little coffin and, um, and they are held down to the base plate through the top, through the set screw. And then there's another, sorry. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there's a difference. Coffin is the traditional Dracula shaped casket uh, is the more there you go. straight thanks, thanks. Yeah. sorry so they're yes. casket shaped casket sorry shape, you know delayed reaction there but yeah dead person vessel yeah. um yeah no they're they're rectangular in shape yeah so um i get i get my um wilkinson style um from from graph tech and um so so it's uh you, you have to fashion your own base plate and on my first guitar it was just it was just a it was a piece of wood. Um, I used Osage for the fretboard and some other things. And so it was this, this uh, base plate of Osage. And um, as long as you can drill holes accurately um, for those those hold down, those lockdown screws, um, it's a really good solution. I've seen a number of builders do this. Um, I've seen Crimson Guitars do this. Um, I've actually seen Mayonnaise do this. Um, trying to think of who else. Um, but it's a really simple option because you can you can build any sort of base plate that you want. I designed my base plate um, in um, in AutoCAD Fusion. Our friend John Songson really helped out with uh, cleaning up that design and and actually um, milled a, a run of, of base plates for me, mm -hmm. um, and out of out of aluminum and and they're they're beautiful. They they turned out so so well. Um, but it doesn't have to be that fancy. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be that right. fancy. If, if you're good with you know with metal, and if you can make an aluminum or a brass base plate, mm -hmm. uh, if you can drill holes accurately, if you can tap um, holes accurately, um, it's it it's a it's a really cool way of doing that. And um, it's it's a lot less expensive than than um, than buying a you know one of the commercially available models. Absolutely. And I, and I think also, you know, to a certain degree with some of this, you know, you might start with your center line and your fret layout and, and then go to your, you know, your headstock and your bridge considerations. However, sometimes, you know, if you're limited to say, you know, you want to use the hip shot bridge, you know, that you want to use, you know, mm -hmm. a certain locking nut or whatever. Um, and and then that may be the thing that dictates your scale length. That may be yes. the thing that yes. one of the things that dictates, you know, exactly what the splay of your frets is going to look like. So mm -hmm. it may be a matter of go buy those pieces first and just take a lot of accurate measurements, put those in yeah. your drawing first, and then you can kind of go from there. So it may be a little bit of reverse engineering, but uh, it, it can still be done. Yeah, no, that's 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 a really good point, and it's it's those compromises between what you're trying to achieve with, with your scale splay and what you're um, what you're kind of set and locked into with with your with your components. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you've got your center line, you've got your scales, you've got your solutions, you've figure, you got figured out for the nut and for the bridge, and now you need to design the next um, amazing guitar, right? Um, so what are you going to do with it? Um, uh, is it is it going to you know copy something that is that is already out there? Is it going to be super original? Um, it's really up to you, and that's that's the awesome thing, the fun thing about, about designing an instrument from the ground up. Um, you know, one of the things that I considered early on in design um, is, is that this multi-scale thing 
um, sort of injects a uh, an asymmetry to the design, and I wanted to I wanted to answer that in the the headstock shape and in the body shape. Um, so one of the things that I did was um, at that nut end, I um, I extended the nut out beyond the width of the fretboard and the headstock, and um, I extended the string lengths above, beyond the length of the, the nut and the headstock. And I started looking at all these intersections of where these lines would fall. And I ended up, you know, basically just tilting the headstock to that nut angle. Um, and so the, the, the tuners, the tuners also fall along that, that asymmetrical projection. Um, on the body length, I did I did something similar, and that is I I, um, I drew an extended line um, from the bridge through throughout past the body, and um, I made that uh, the first thing I did was I made that lower bout tilt to the angle of to match or to closely match the angle of the bridge, and um, and then I found some other um, you know uh, pleasing shapes. Um, into the, the the upper bout area, and you know, made a, a decision about uh, cutaways and um, horns and and things like that on the body, and um, you know, trying to also fit things into what would be considered normal guitar sizes. Sure. Know, so, uh, sticking with you know a body length that's somewhere around twenty to twenty two inches, uh, sticking with a body width that is somewhere around thirteen to fourteen inches in the in the lower bout, um, and you know, because you know, you, you don't have to um, necessarily build based on you know what your your case is going to be, but you do need to consider you know what kind of case <laughs> you carry this guitar around. Yes, don't it. forget that. Like, <laughs> do not forget that. Because it, you know the 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 solutions could be pretty expensive, you know, depending on how, how you want to do that. So I mean, that right there, you know, in the last segment we talked about using your. Um, your components like your bridge as a as a compromise point and, and how your scales are going to lay out um, you know you might want to look at the um, um, the footprint of um, your typical strat or your les paul or something like that and and see if you can make something that that falls within that and consider consider um, that is sort of like your outside limits um, but uh, you know t take some time take some time on on your design um, you know, something I did early on was I created a, a full size uh, cardboard cutout. I was living in an apartment at the time and I went out to the, to the, um, the cardboard recycling bin and I found a big box that would accommodate the full length of an instrument. And I, and I drew it out and I cut it out and I, and I would, I would sit with it on my lap and I would stand and hold it. And I'd imagine fretting, um, you know, this this particular multi-scale uh, orientation that I had chosen. I'd look at where my hand was, you know, in relation to the bridge. Um, I would, uh, you know, set it on a guitar stand over in the corner and just mm -hmm. kind of like, get in, you know, let it be there. And and as I, you know, just kind of went about my daily life and seeing this guitar out of the corner of my eye and and. Um, and, you know, going back and making some changes, making, you know, cutting off a chopping off a section, um, you know, taking some extra cardboard and tape and adding on an area here, um, redoing the whole thing and, and trying again, um, considering shifting the whole neck uh, segment, the whole string segment uh, farther into the body, farther out of the body. Just really take some time with it. Um, you know, once you once you start looking at things full size, you might realize there are some things that um, there's just some just some curves that look wrong. There are just some um, some intersections of the body and the neck that just don't don't work. Um, you know, the neck is sticking out too far here, or the the bridge is too far back there, or um, this you know crunches up my control area here, mm -hmm. um, or or this is going to feel weird. You know, if I was considering a full thickness instrument, this is going to feel weird under my arm right here. Um, or maybe I'm and, slinging my guitar too low. Yeah, yeah. That'd be another yeah. thing. Is like if you bring it up, that changes the angle that your arm approaches the bridge, and right. you know perhaps the angle at which you know because if you're doing all that, that, that palm muting and stuff, yeah, um, that's part of your style for sure. Your bridge is gonna matter. Yeah. 
so so that's um that, that's that's how I kind of went about it. Um, I like to think that I I came upon some designs that are aesthetically pleasing and are functionally um, functional. Um, <laughs> I'm over here giving about, the thumbs up or the thank thumb. you. <laughs> what about you, Paul? You're, you're you are a designer. You've designed many guitars and are still yeah um, designing instruments and refining designs for Danger Brand. Mm -hmm. What um, if you were gonna throw down that that multi-scale um and start designing a guitar around it what would you do yeah well I, I mean i'm definitely thinking about it now you know it's it's something that i want to do like i'm i'm kind of taking like all the danger brand designs right now and adapting them all to like a 25 and a half inch scale you mm -hmm. know straight and then um making sure that they all work with the neck bolt joint that i want to do and everything like that and then and then you know, after that, it's kind of like, okay, well, well what do the people want? Do they want basses? Or are they going to want multi-scale? Are they going to want baritone guitars? Like, whatever, you know what I mean? And it's like, if it comes to multi-scale, the idea is, okay, well, let's do multi-scale for all the models. And if we're going to do multi-scale for all the models, how are we going to do the multi-scale? So it's all the design considerations that we've already talked about in this mm -hmm. episode and with Frank, you know, about what scale lengths do you do on either side and, uh, you know where that perpendicular fret is and all, mm -hmm. all, all the things you know all mm -hmm. the things but i think for me usually it starts with i just want to make something that looks cool you know so mm -hmm. i start with a thing that looks cool and then i'm going to adapt it to the scale length but i have to also figure that you know when you're going multi-scale you're dealing with a lot of jazz players you're dealing with a lot of metal players uh for the most part obviously not everybody mm -hmm. but um they want that upper fret access and they want those 24 frets, you know, they want that yeah. whole thing. And the, in large part, most of the guitars that I've designed in my career have all been 22 frets mm. with, you know, not bad upper fret access, but you know, equ equal to a Strat Tele Les Paul kind of upper yeah. fret access. So it's a, it's a kind of a different beast when you're trying to balance this thing and then also give a nice healthy cutaway on that area. And, for me, I know it's um, it it's hopefully not going to be too much of a challenge because I do design a lot of offset guitars where the waist is shifted. So you've uh -huh. already got that upper horn, upper cutaway. Uh, the horn is already extended out farther, and the 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 treble side horn is already kind of tucked in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So that's I think going to be very helpful. Um, but uh, you know, beyond that, I'm questioning what kind of hardware I'm going to want to use. I think I would I would like to ultimately design my own. But in lieu of that, you, you know, I, I like the Wilkinson uh, saddles. I think that's a really cool way to go. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about this a lot right now and how I would want to design a multi scale instrument. I think that for for me, for my purposes, you know, I would maybe want to start with like a subtle fan, like not too aggressive mm -hmm. um uh, just because I, I don't know that's what appeals to me that just kind of what seems like a good idea to me i but i also don't have arthritis or tendonitis mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. like that so it's um you know i i, I think i just like the look of the of the yeah. more subtle uh you know splay uh, as opposed to the the more extreme ones that i've seen i can see i can see uh multi-scale working with a lot of a lot of your designs, um, the 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 shipbird in particular is one of my <laughs> favorites, and um, that I I can I can see I can see a, a gentle splay on that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you, you would be just like all of us here coming up against uh, you know component considerations and mm -hmm. what are your limitations there. Um, it, you you like to put you know mastery style trims on things. Mm -hmm. um, it would it would require a uh, um, you know a a, a tunematic style or or a, a roller bridge or or something mm -hmm. that had a little bit more of an angle. And I'm seeing I'm seeing some stuff out there. Um, uh, for example, um, our friend from the show, uh, Michael King, uh, Cow Brand, um, Electro Strings on, mm -hmm. on Instagram. Um, he's had he's had some bridges um, made for him recently. Yeah, that, beautiful. Um, 
can't, I can't remember who's making those for him. I think it's um, Aldridge Empire. Yes, yes, it's Aldridge. Um, and uh, I could I could very very easily see that design tweaked a little bit to put an angle on there, even if it yeah. was just you know a half an inch, mm-hmm. um, to go you know do a, like a twenty five and a half to a twenty six or twenty twenty six and a half or something like that. Um, when it comes to when it comes to uh, a, a trim where the the trim is the the fixed termination. Um, uh, a friend of a friend of um, John Songson and I. Um, his name's Kevin Kingray. He's a, a CAD designer for um, for in situ in Hood River in situ's uh, Boeing's uh, drone subsidiary. Um, he he uh, he's played my guitars and and he really likes them and he says, man, I want to design a a trim for you. So mm-hmm. it's gonna be um, it's it's probably gonna be taking my the design I have right now and figuring out how to 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 create a you know a pivot point or something. Mm. Um, the, the the really encouraging thing is that that uh, you know Strandberg has done so much in terms of R and D of 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 multi scale, um, not just with like the headless part of it, but just all of this the scale orientations. And all of the bridge and you know, hardware considerations. Um, so, so on that, you know, on that guitar, that six string guitar that Strandberg makes, where where the the zero fret is the neutral fret, and everything falls away from it. They, you know, so that the bridge is angled. The bridge mm-hmm. is completely angled. Mm-hmm. But he builds that with both a fixed fixed bridge and a a trim. Um, yeah. And and what he found out was that you don't have to have a um, a string termination being being perpendicular uh, to the center line in order to be able to get do a trim thing and and let it be in tune and stuff. So in other words, that angled that angled bridge can rotate over that angle and it's okay. Mm-hmm. So um, there, th- I think that was that was sort of a big breakthrough in kind of understanding how. How trims work with with multi scale. So, um, those are those are some options that are possible. Yeah, well, and you know, you mentioned the mastery vibrato that that, that I'm a big fan of, and the bridge itself, I it, I think it could be rotated. It could be you know angled in order to uh, to to compensate for a multi scale, but you can only go so far with it. Yeah, you know what I mean, so that would be string widths. Yeah, exactly. So that would be a, a consideration. I could maybe get away with like a, a very slight angle mm-hmm. on that. Um, so it would be a, a, a really subtle fan. Um, and then your, you know, string spacing at the bridge might not be ideal. So that's definitely a question. However, as far as just the idea of having a bridge that is separate from your vibrato, you know, and a yeah. vibrato that's just behind, um, huh. you know, I don't see any reason why that couldn't work on a multi-scale instrument. Yeah. Um, if, you know, if you had a bridge that, that works and, um, you know, it's, it's just that same concept of, you know, the strings sliding through the saddles or yeah. rolling over a roller or, uh, you know, whatever. Um, I think that, that the vast majority of multi-scale instruments that are out there, um, you know, if they do have a vibrato, it's, it's modeled after, you know, a Stratocaster style vibrato where it's sort mm-hmm. of integrated into the bridge. Yeah. But I don't see any reason why you couldn't just have a bridge that, is a standalone unit and then put even a Bigsby behind it, you know, anything yeah. that you like, you know, and, and in terms, you know, you talked about that Strandberg, that pivot point being on an angle thing. A lot of times with those, those mastery or that, you know, that traditional jazz master style vibrato, because it's a single spring and it's, and it's sort of balanced on this one plate with the arm offset to one side, mm-hmm. you actually kind of get more, uh, down, down, downward motion yeah. on the treble side than you do on the oh, bass. So your really your vibrato is not a true like even vibrato the way that mm-hmm. a that, that a Strat or that a Bigsby vibrato is. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it it drops all the strings the same amount. The Jazzmaster vibrato actually tilts a little bit more on the treble side. It's it's kind of progressive from low to high, right? And right. I think that that actually adds to some of its sort of characteristic sound, and it's my. Right. I use it a lot. I have used it a lot on a lot of my guitars because I uh-huh. like that sound. I think it works really yeah. well. It gives you this really sort of watery warble that is, you know, characteristic of what it comes from, but it is is unique and it's it's different from that, 
you know, that, that Floyd Rose Stratocaster yeah. style vibrato yeah. that, that's a little more short and staccato, you know? So it, 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 I think it can also depend on the sound that you're going after and, and, and the mood that you're trying to create with the thing. And, and, you know, it's, it's so cool that so many multi-scale instruments are being made these days because maybe at some point, you know, we'll see some sort of like, you know, wider string spacing mastery bridge that we can, you know, put at an angle and, you know, yeah, well, I mean, it, like it, when it came to when it came to those those hip shot bridges, it 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 required somebody like Perry Ormsby who was was going to a level of um, of manufacturing production that um, that he he had the he, he just started having the buying power to mm -hmm. to be able to work with uh, a, a component manufacturer to to make that happen. So, so it's. I think it's going to take. I think it's going to take a few other people um, being able to do that. And inst so, instead of having maybe you know just a, a one-off um, bridge or something that like that machined for um, for a single instrument or something like that, having a um, working with a with a, a component company to be able to put those designs on file with them. And uh, whether it's a it's a made to order thing or whether it's something that they start offering because they realize that there's a demand for it, um, it's gonna it's just gonna take more people doing it and 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 demonstrating that it is uh, it's a viable viable option. Um, I mean, just just what you're talking about right there with the uh, that that mastery jazz master style, having sort of that um, um, you know detuning you're not only just detuning it when you when you dive down but you're de detuning it across the strings there's precedence for a certain mm -hmm. sound yeah. so you, you know you don't have to be able to bar a six string chord and have it you know detune all perfectly in tune with mm -hmm. relation to each other mm -hmm. um there are different things that different people want um and so it's it's just going to be a matter of of uh, getting those on some instruments getting some attention um, and uh, and and letting and letting people uh, kind of vote with their their wallets on, yeah. <laughs> on how on how um, on how the future of guitar design looks and sounds. Future, future. So one more consideration uh, to think about when you're when you're splaying everything out here um, with your scales is what do you do with your pickups? Um, and uh, there are there are examples. There is precedence for simply doing nothing. You just you just yeah. put them where you normally put them. Normal pickups, um, normal yeah, angles, it, straight yeah, up and down. Yeah, perpendicular with the center line, and that's fine. Um, I don't think I don't think when it comes to um, you know. Uh, Distances between, you know, the, the 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 low E to the bridge pickup versus high E to the bridge pick. I don't think that you're going to create any sort of weirdness um, when you're doing that. Um, if anything, you might end up with finding some some new interesting sounds by those placements of the of the pickups along the the various um, node or or partial lines of the string. Um, um, there are some other uh, manufacturers, builders that just simply take a standard pickup and kind of tilt it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, for single single coils, this is not noticeable at all. I mean, obviously you've got um, you know Telecaster um, that's that's um, got a, an angled bridge pickup. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody thinks that's weird. Um, when you take a you know a rectangular um, humbucker though and tilt it, that can kind of look a little bit just. just like it's just simply tilted, um, but there are some uh, some manufacturers, uh, some some aftermarket pickup uh, manufacturers that do have um, custom base plates. So basically, instead of just taking a, a rectangular um, humbucker and tilting it, they do they do the parallelogram thing. So this the you know the sides the sides of that rectangle stay along with the center line, and then it just it's it just angles down. Um, and uh, that uh, that's an upcharge, I think, from those folks. Um, you could you could also, if you were going to go that way, um, you know, if you were going to do um, buy some pickups, you could uh, take them apart and build your own base plates for them. Um, I wind my own pickups, but I 
I, I could I could do that if the customer really wanted a Seymour Duncan or a um, uh, you know bare knuckle or something like that. I could pull the base plate and make a custom base plate for it. Custom base plates could be really made out of anything, um, as long as it's not going to really mess with your with your uh, magnet uh, structure and everything like that. Mm-hmm. The magnet field, um, nickel silver is is preferable, but anything else that's inert, you know, you could do it out of four bond. You could do it out of wood. Uh, I've seen people three D print them out of plastic, mm-hmm. um, and so uh, you know what you what you do with the pickup angle is is up to you, and whether it's going to exactly follow the um, um, the angle of the frets, um, if is, is your, is your neck pickup going to be slightly less angled than your bridge pickup? Because if there's more, there's more tilt towards the, the bridge side. Um, are you going to keep them the same? Um, what are you going to do with that? That's, it's something that just kind of goes along with the overall aesthetic. It's not really a, it's not really a, I don't think it's a, a serious tone consideration or th- there's no, sure. There's no big um, detriment to having a straight. Yeah, pickup. there's no right or wrong way to do yeah, it, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you know one thing that I think about is is like with even thinking about like a Telecaster or a Stratocaster, um, the way that those are usually tilted is um, with the uh, the sort of the base side closer to the nut and then the, the treble side closer to the bridge. Yeah. And so I think what you know what the, the sort of result that you get from that is um, even even uh, sort of higher, uh, t- uh, more twang, I guess, you know, yeah. on, on your treble strings mm-hmm. and, a, and a better bass response from your low strings. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think for me, for a bridge pickup that's angled, I would almost like to see it kind of done the other way. You know, I've mm-hmm. seen guys take like left-handed tele bridges yeah, and put yeah, them in right. a telecaster so that you get it the other way because then you get that tighter bass and a, like a looser treble. So, yeah. you know, interestingly with the multi-scale thing, if you're matching angles... Um, you know, again, you kind of end up with that, uh, y- you know, you're probably going to end up with that. It's going to be angled in the opposite direction uh, of mm-hmm. a Telecaster, so tighter mm-hmm. base, looser mm-hmm. treble. Um, mm-hmm. Or, I guess, since it's a matching the multi-scale, it's mm-hmm. really not doing any of those things. But, yeah. uh, you know, you've seen that Perry Ormsby uh, single coil neck pickup that he does with, like, the 27 fret guitars mm-hmm. um, that that is, like, right up against the fretboard, and it's angled way the other way right right, or the, right. The, the, i guess the quote-unquote normal way uh, yeah you know yeah um so you know tighter treble looser bass uh uh-huh. so there's all different ways to do it i think and again there's just there's no right or wrong way to do it it's just kind of total preference yeah and if you are taking um standard um components um whether you're whether you're buying pickups or whether you're um whether you're you're, you're winding your own um as you take the, the those those bobbins and you rotate them, as you angle them, you end up having a uh, a narrower uh, st- spacing, pole to pole spacing. So so yeah. so people like like Perry Ormsby, who's doing that very radically angled single coil um, on his I can't remember if it's the hype or the SX guitars. Um, the um, they have he has to have. Um, uh, custom bobbins made for those yeah. because the the pole the pole width would need to be wider, and um, you know that's something I, I buy my I buy my bobbins from Mojo Tone, and I figured out um, this kind of happy compromise with the angle, um, so it looks good with the the display of the frets, but also you know I I again full scale drawings and you know on my FretFine 2D um, templates. You know, you take a bobbin, you set it down there uh, on the center line, and then you start tilting it, and you see at what point in time do the outside strings um, start falling beyond the bobbin, and when, where would you want to stop that? You know, so I, I get the widest, the widest string spread. Um, was it 50, 52 millimeter um, string spread on on those bobbins, and I I tilt them just so that it catches it just right, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it works out pretty well. Yeah, it works out pretty well. Okay, Jason. So, do you think you know how to build a multi-scale guitar now? 
Yeah, yeah Mortal Kombat's gonna take out the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I do. <laughs> I know you do because I've seen you do it. Um, but yeah, I think there's just a lot of these considerations that that uh, I'm not. I wasn't even fully aware of all of it, you know. And I think between this and everybody should go back and listen to Frank Falbo talk about a few things, and mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, hopefully. It gives some people the confidence they need to uh, put the pen to the paper, and uh, right. maybe go out and design a multi-scale guitar. And even if you're even if you're just maybe in the market for buying one, um, mm -hmm. it, or if you have an opportunity, like I said at the top of the show, if you're at a you know a guitar show or a, or a, your, your favorite boutique shop, and that you're lucky enough to see a multi-scale instrument in there, now maybe you'll be a little bit more um, educated in terms of what you're looking at. Um, so instead of just kind of being wowed and like, oh my gosh, look at this thing, you start to look at little details like, okay, where is that neutral fret? And what did they do with the nut and with the um, with the bridge? And oh, look at that, they did angle the, the pickups. And, and just start to appreciate a little bit more some of the, the considerations that went into the design and the manufacture of that instrument. It's definitely a lot of stuff. Yeah. Why are them frets so slanty? <laughs> Why are them frets going on there? <laughs> But you know, just like anything, you're um, you're coming upon upon something new. There's uh, you know, there's this new pile of vocabulary. There's this just new um, new perspective that uh, you need to kind of adjust to. And once you figure that out, you realize, oh, this is this is totally a viable option for um, uh, maybe some of the some of the challenges that you're having with your own playing or your own um, you know musical sort of uh, roadblocks. Um, Hopefully, hopefully uh, you'll, you'll give out, give a try to a multi-scale instrument and consider, consider adding one to your lineup, whether that be through a purchase or your own, your own construction. Yeah, exciting, awesome. Well, this uh, this wraps it up. This is the end. Episode one six zero. Six zero. And for those of you that don't know, one six zero is the number of episodes we have. There's only ever a hundred episodes available on iTunes. There's only ever 100 episodes available for free on Podbean. But mm -hmm. that means there's like a whole 60 episodes that you can't access anymore unless you are a podcast patron. Uh, so, uh, and there's actually some additional stuff in there. Uh, we do occasionally right. throw new things in there as well. Some interesting conversations that uh, aren't on the regular part of the show. So, I think it's like 173, maybe, if you count all that stuff. Wow. Oh, some, there's some extra stuff in there, you know, some good, fun fun things. Extra goodies. That's right. So uh, I would encourage everybody that uh, has not already to go ahead and become a podcast patron. There is a link for that in the podcast description. Mm -hmm. That's all I'll say about it for now. So thanks, everybody, for listening to the show. I've been Paul Roney. I've been Jason Rogers. Bye. Bye.